Hey guys, this is Mike and Joe from Deep Wood Force of Will. Bah, 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 bah. And we're here with our list of the top 10 cards from Curse of the Frozen Casket, the newest set for Force of Will. Yep, it just came out. Well, we just had the pre release last weekend, and it should be coming out at the end of the month this week. Exactly, just to date this, <laughs> to date this video. Yep. Uh, so these are our top 10 picks. These are the cards we think have the most potential coming out of this set. These are the cards we think that are going to make waves in the meta and are going to see a lot of play. So if you see them in your polls, be happy about it. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, let's just let's not beat around the bush. Let's get right into it with our first card, Fairy Tale Library Alexandria. And it's our first card on the list. It's an addition, not a field edition. If you were looking for that, we had a little bit of a change between sets, which is a good thing. It's a two mana, two will, one red, one colorless. When this card enters your field, choose a race. Resonators you control, the chosen race gains swiftness. So obviously from what it looks like right now, for two mana, the card essentially does nothing on its own, which is the reason it's not higher on the list, but the potential of this card is insane. Well, something I noticed is uh, most additions on two mana would draw you a card, this one doesn't, so there is a little bit of a balancing factor there that I didn't even consider. Yeah, exactly. But the fact that it can just have this huge burst potential, because uh, certain races in the game just go in tandem with each other very well, such yep. as uh, we got a few examples over here being dragons, fairy tales, and angels. Uh, and there's also other ones on the list like uh, elves and Cthulhu, Cthulhu and uh, Knights of the Round Table. Yes, but we didn't list those. those. That's just more to go off of. But uh, again, anything that could put into the field for cheap or have other things that come into the field with a similar race, or the same race, not similar, it's gotta be the same. And buff it, then. And buff it, yeah. You get good effects off that. Uh, first and foremost, we have Gwyber. Gwyber is a uh, one mana 12 12 if you're playing it right. And in those circumstances, every time you play one, that's 1200 additional damage to the face. And you start stacking that up, and every turn, your opponent can't deal with the pressure. Uh, Alexandria is basically a two mana kill spell. Yeah. When you put it that way, it's really good. And then, uh, of course, we have uh, Tinkerbell the Fairy. Uh, fairy Tales and Fairies are both pretty common races that see a lot of usage, uh, especially with like the swarm capability. Yep, and when decks swarm, ex oh, especially since they have a lot of small drops, the small drops get more value out of them if they're able to just hit the face first before dying. Exactly. And then of course on the last on the list is uh, everybody's favorite, Celestial Wing Seraph, uh, the one that just tosses Lucifer into the field, you banish a Resonator, and if you have uh, Fairy Tale Library out, you give them both swiftness. And that's 1900 worth of damage, you also get 600 worth of healing off the Seraph, and even more if you want to pay the Dark and Moon for Lucifer. So obviously it's a lot of late game push, and the card is extremely strong in that regard and has a lot of combo potential, which is why we placed it on this list. Yep. And on to our number nine, it's a toss up between two cards that are basically the same. Uh, they have the same implication to them, which are Invitation of Disaster and Rising from the Depths. Uh, there was a little bit of an argument between us if one of this is better than the other, but we consider this card's a little bit similar enough that it's reasonable. So Invitation of Disaster, we're just going to consider it with the Awakening, is right. deal 2,000 damage to your opponent's face. That's, That's the main thing what you're going to use it for. That's insane. And the other one is return all resonators to the hand and then put up to three water resonators from your hand into the field. Especially in tandem with another card that we'll see later, this card is going to single-handedly be the thing that brings Mercurius into the metagame. And without Invitation of Disaster, people probably wouldn't play Mars. Yeah, we have both of those here. Obviously, putting 10 mana counters on each of these is going to be insane when you can use all those mana counters to pay for your big kill spells. Yep, that's the main play that you're going for with these things. You're just going to try and judgment as quick as possible, get your kill spell ready, activate the kill spell, and wipe the board, and do whatever you need to do, and win the game from right there. Exactly. So, not much needs to be said about these cards. Obviously, they work really well in tandem with these rulers. They're the only reason these rules are probably going to see play. And also, as uh, we keep moving on through Lapis Cluster, there's going to be more of these Dark Commanders and more of these Ancient Magics, so as we keep going, we're going to get better and better uh, use out of these cards, because... These cards can only get better from here on in. Yep, because we could get more Ancient Magics that 
looking to work with these cards. And you basically get to play them for free if these guys are your rulers. Yep. So, moving on, we got our number 8 slot goes to Cheshire Cat, Guide to the Mysterious World. Uh, this card was really interesting when we first saw it, uh, especially because of its uh, last effect, which basically says play this ability once per turn, remove a card in your hand from the game, or put a card from your removed area that was removed by this card into your hand. And because of that, you get the first effect, which is it gains flying, first strike, swiftness, and or position. With all those texts in, in mind, and you also get plus one, plus one for each card in your removed area. Uh, that was you removed get, by that card. <laughs> yeah. Um, you wind up having a 7-7 seven, seven on two that gains a bunch of different texts, which makes it the best aggro, aggro two drop in the game. Yep, uh, a few notable cards that can be removed are Flame Sprite, Snow White the Valkyrie of Passion, and the big one, Prisia Pursuant of Exploding Flame. Yep, with uh, Flame Sprite you get Flying in Swiftness, which is basically unblockable 700 damage on two, which is great. Yep. Prisia is Swiftness, First Strike, and Target Attack, so you get to basically trade into something for free. On and Snow White two. does. Yep, and Snow White does that as well. So. Obviously, Cheshire Cat has a lot of really good synergies with these cards. Uh, you have to play multicolored deck to use them properly, but in this format, multicolored decks are not hard to come by at all. And also, she doesn't wreck your curve because you can't just add the card back like on turn three after you've sw already swung in with the Cheshire Cat. That's a seven-seven. You can then add back like your Snow White to your hand and then play the Snow White on three. So she fits very well into a lot of curves. Basically, every basically you can put stuff in your hand into your. Uh, removed area for safekeeping if need be. She just has a lot of really good implications to her, and I, we think that she's going to see a lot of play. And especially with the next card on our list being the ruler for her. Yep. We've got Charlotte Determined Girl. So Charlotte was an interesting card when we first saw her. We really didn't know what to do with her, but as we saw more and more cards, we finally got a nice place to work with her. Yep. Uh, her judgment's very low cost, being water and one void. She's one of the few rulers that has a cost of two, but only one needed uh, color. Yep, and her judgment is very good, but first off, we gotta talk about the front side of her card, which actually has, is a really good effect, which is pay a water, discard a card, and rest target resonator. At first you're like, eh, that's not that great of effect, until you think about Necromancy of the Undead Lord. Exactly. Uh, we have two options here for this uh, Mana Sync and Discard Outlet, being Necromancy of the Undead Lord, um, obviously putting this card into the graveyard for one mana, and then having it for later turns is incredible. And you still get a benefit from getting to rest things, so you can stop things from blocking you, which is awesome. Which makes her really good for aggro decks. Mm -hmm. so and she also combos with Sniper from the blind spot. Exactly, because again, resting things is good, and then you just return it to the hand, massive tempo swings, and she'll be really good for that control aspect as well. Yep. So she fits a lot of different decks, she's going to have a lot of archetypes built around her, and she's just a very versatile ruler. And when she judgments, she turns that uh, just that resting effect into a send back effect, which is kind of like Refrain in that way, which was a really strong effect of him. It was very oppressive to decks that couldn't deal with it. Yep. And also she refills her hand, which can be devastating to decks that are trying to uh, grind out all of her resources. Exactly. And also, if you're playing the aggro Charlotte build, the moment you uh, judgment, you just refill your hand after you've run out of steam. Yep, which is amazing. So, we see her being really good in this format. Uh, she's one of our top ruler picks. Uh, you'll see yep. a couple of others coming up later. Spoiler, spoilers. Hmm. So, on to our next picks, we have kind of a toss up between Red Riding Hood and Sorceress of Heavenly Wind, Melfi, just because they kind of fill the same purpose. Yep, they're similar ideas. They're a little different, though. Uh, we think Melfi's going to fit more of a tempo style, where you're trying to just ran uh, curve out in a rampant style and use that ran rainbow color that she has on her on her tap effect to basically, you know, curve out, make whatever color you need to have happen. But Red Riding Hood, on the other hand, is making is trying to just like ramp out using something like Blessing of Yggdrasil but yep. on a better body, you get a 3-4 body with it, and even a 7-7 seven, seven in the late game as opposed to Blessing, which was a dead draw in the late game. Yeah, she's a 7-7 seven, seven with Swiftness, First Strike, and Precision in the late game. Which is as Insane. good as Cheshire Cat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, obviously, she's going to be seeing some play. Uh, we have our comparison cards here, uh, one of which is from Alice Cluster, and the two others are no longer in the New Frontiers format. They're kind of, they've kind of been replaced by these other two cards. 
Yep, first was Blessing, which we already talked about. It's a direct comparison to Red Riding Hood because you get to put a stone from your deck on, from your stone deck on top, or uh, however you want to say it. Riding Hood also has a very similar aspect to Gretel, where you take where it's a body that puts a card on top of your from the top of your magic stone uh, area into your magic stone area. Yep. And Feet Sing is very comparable to Melfi. It's just that Melfi is cheaper, but has that torrent effect built in, as opposed to Feet Sing just having the enter that always act happens. Exactly. So we've got very similar cards here, but uh, obviously the ones that we have right now fill different roles than these other cards do, really. It's also very important to note that Gretel and Feet Sing were very heavily played when they were available in Grim Cluster. And we could see ramp decks coming back with uh, these new smaller variants. Yep, and having a cheaper feet sing is going to be great for that for those decks. Absolutely, a quick cast blocker for that cheap that produces will. Yep, it's going to be a good time. <laughs> so moving on, we got our number five pick, which is a card that saw a lot of play at the uh, uh, draft tournament, the uh, sealed play tournament, which is Charlotte's Water Transformation Magic. Uh, this is a pretty good card. It's very comparable to uh, a very popular side deck card that we have in the game right now. Uh, it's one will, quick cast, remnant, target resonator loses all abilities, becomes a 4-4 bear until end of turn. So basically you remove all the text on it, turn it into a bear, and you get to kill it very easily. Yep, and the fact that this is quick cast, which means you can play it on your opponent's turn, it has remnant, so if you have the will left over and it's in the graveyard, you remove it from the grave, activate the effect again. It's multiple instances of ability loss, multiple debuffs. It's just a card that's insanely good. And we've got two cards to compare it to. Uh, the first is Fairy Flower Extract. Uh, this card was kind of hyped from the last set, but just because it was an addition instead of a instant, uh, it did not see the play that it needed to see. Just put, making things a 200, 300, just on your turn at the same speed as any spell chant just was not powerful enough. Not at all. And then, obviously, it compares to Final Forfeit, because Final Forfeit makes things lose abilities, and it's quick cast. So... Yep, and Final Forfeit was, uh, was uh, needed in aggro decks as a way to stop Arthur Pendragon from ruining their day. Yep. And Fairy Flower, not a Fairy Flower Extract, uh, Water Ma Transformation Magic does that job so much better by turning it into a 4-4 so you can remove it on the spot as opposed to just negating the effects of Arthur. And it happens twice. <laughs> and so basically they have to, you can get rid of two Arthurs for free as opposed to one. Yeah, they spent 10 mana to play two Arthurs and you pay two mana to make them bears. Turns out it's pretty good. It's pretty solid. So obviously Water Transformation Magic is just going to it's just kind of the best of both worlds compared to these two cards, and it's definitely going to see play in the new Frontiers format. Definitely. So on to our number four pick. We've got our second ruler on the list, and it is Umer at Tau, Master of a Thousand Keys. We're just going to call him Yogg, because when he flips over, he becomes uh, Yogg Sothoth. Yogg Sothoth, the uh, Keeper of a Thousand Doors? Yep, that's the one. Look at that dapper little man. <laughs> dapper man with a key. Nope, that's a giant silver key. That's a giant silver key. <laughs> and a top hat. And a top hat. And then he becomes a tentacled monstrosity on the flip side, but we don't have the flip side here. Yeah, we don't need it. We got Dapper Man. That's all we need. So, basically what Yogg is, is a very cheap judgment. Obviously, the uh, lowest you can pay is just one black. But if you pay any others, he comes into play with uh, X limit counters plus one. Yeah, so he's crazy in my eyes. Because yep. if you don't know his stats, which we probably should have put here, but yep. whatever, he's a 15-15. That's crazy. A one-mana judgment that gives you a 15-15. That is horrifying. Combine that with Regalia, forget yep. about it. Combine with Regalia, on turn two, you could just energize his judgment and get 15 damage for free. <laughs> it's pretty scary. It's also kind of hilarious. I actually yep. like this card a lot. Yeah, I, th I think this card's definitely going to see some play. And also the fact that it flips back at, uh, if you have no limit counters on it, it flips back to its ruler side at the beginning of the next turn where it had no counters, and you take 500 damage. This may seem like a detriment, but you avoid Black Moonbeam doing this. Yep, and that's definitely going to be a scary card coming into the next format since we have a lot of G rulers and not a lot of rulers that want to just stick us rulers. Exactly. So, uh, the fact that Yogg can just 
dodge that card. It can dodge a lot of effects. Uh, Levitine is going to be insane with it. Apollo is going to be great with it. We're going to see multicolored decks because of Rulers of Moria. He just has a lot of good going for him. <laughs> Uh, do we have any comparable cards to him? We do have two comparable cards. One is from uh, uh, back in uh, the Wanderer format, while the other is still a New Frontiers card. So, the first one we got is a very famous card that made a lot of people want to stop playing this game. <laughs> Bahamut. So, the, who piloted the deck Baja Blast. Yep. The famous turn one, play the egg, play the Thuga, play the Thuga, then uh, use all that with uh, Levitine Judgment into Bahamut and swing for 1,200 in the air. And you would deal, like, tons and tons of damage on turn one without even, like, thinking. Yep. Thought and swinging. With Yogg, you, you have to think a little more because he's designed that way. However, with Yogg, you get another effect to make up for the mindless swim swinging, which is basically Dark Alice's Enter effect, just a little bit more reasonable. Yep. Which is, you have to pay, like, X amount of mana. The X you pay lets you destroy a Resonator of that cost. It's pretty solid. Yep. Not and... a Resonator, all Resonators of that cost. Yeah. So, basically, you get free kill spells off your Judgment, and then your J-Ruler flips back, and then you can do it again. So you have in endless amounts of kill spells as long as Yogg doesn't die. Yep, same thing that Alice kind of does. Except, yeah, Alice doesn't usually... If she dies, she's usually dead. Yeah. Even though so, she had Schrodinger, but that's another story. Yep. So obviously, comparing uh, Yogg to these two incredibly powerful rulers that have a lot of history with them in the game, uh, but we're definitely going to see him get some play. Yep. I'm excited for him. I'm going to play him. I, I pulled one at the sneak at the sneak peek. Woo! <laughs> so, on to our number three. We've alluded to this guy earlier, and it is Captain Hook the pirate. <laughs> and man, when I saw this card. <laughs> I, I like playing Shion, so this is a card that Shion loves to see. It's a five cost. Five cost, perfect in range of Shion. Thousand, thousand. thousand. Good Solid stats. Stats. Yep. When this card enters your field, choose one. Put up to two target special magic stones on top of their owner's magic stone deck in any order, or return up to two target resonators to their owner's hands. So, you guess you, you have two choices here. You get the opponent mana stuck, or you rip apart their tempo. <laughs> That's really strong. Look at that smirk. He knows exactly what he's doing to the opponent. Yep. He's got that dagger. He's like, mmm, you want it? <laughs> so, obviously Captain Hook is a very strong card because of these two effects. Uh, he provides immediate board presence and can either slow down your opponent's tempo through their stones or through what they have on the field. So we have a couple of cards to compare him to. Uh... Well, two, to com two uh, that uh, get him out easily, and one that you can compare him to. Obviously, we know that uh, Coup d'etat Mastermind Shion can drop him out with her judgment. Yep, and doing that is cheats him in, so he's a basically like a three mana rip apart your opponent's stone base. Pretty insane. And then you have uh, Rising from the Depths. This is why it's such a kill spell, because the idea is you return all resonators to the hand, and then you drop three hooks. And then their stones are gone. All of them. <laughs> if you do this by turn six, your opponent has no cards to play. And then they have to call for a stone. And they have a one mana answer to deal with three hooks and a J ruler. Which is going to kill them because Mercurius has a thousand attack too, so they have four exactly thousand damage thousand. on board. Yep. <laughs> Pretty insane. And the last thing we have to compare it to is Bloody Moon, which was the only other card that we can think of that has stone destruction. Yep. Uh... Hook doesn't exactly destroy stones, but it technically removes them. So it's very comparable to Bloody Moon. Bloody Moon didn't see a lot of play because obviously there's no body, uh, destroys it's one three stone mana. for three mana. Uh, but Hook is just all of that in a much better package. Yep, it's going to see a lot of play and it's going to be the card to fear. It's a reason that Tell a Fairy Tale got banned in Wanderer format. <laughs> so. Like Dang, that's a scary card. Yep, so we're definitely going to see that card get a lot of play. So be on the lookout for Hook. Uh, if you really fear Hook enough, make a monocolor deck. With Peter Pan. <laughs> With Peter Pan. <laughs> and uh, number two is uh, another ruler. And this is our basically top pick ruler from the set. I'm not trying to give everything away. But 
This is she uh, zero six age of light. Oh my god. Well, so we got zero here. Zero is a. I think she's gonna be one of the better side deck rulers because she does a lot against uh, really aggressive rulers. She has a judgment of two light, which is cheap as can be, and she has a, a dark uh, pay dark, and you can target Jez J Resonator loses flying first strike swiftness precision and imperishable. Just all the keywords, pretty much. Yep, and that's target J Resonator, so you can drop out J rulers with that too. Well, that should be your main target. But yeah. her flip side, on the other hand, makes that a free continuous effect, which is yep. insane. And she also becomes an 11-11 body with precision, and she takes no battle damage while she's attacking. Lots of really, really good effects there. Her support is also very good, as you'll see over here. Uh, on the left, we have her familiar. Zero's familiar. Yep, it's a 5-5 is... flying. The J ruler gains barrier, which means that she cannot be black moon beamed. And that's all you need to run on good control deck. That's all the reason you need. And if you J activate zero, uh, it becomes an 8 8 with flying for two mana. Man, the, the hits just keep on coming. Also, a uh, quick little fact that I realized uh, the quote on the bottom says, There you are, Feath. I bet you just wandered off on your own again. Uh, zero named her familiar Feath. <laughs> ah, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And then over on the right, we have Zero's Magic Light. Uh, this card's going to be seen in a lot of decks, but especially in the Zero deck. It's a instant speed removal card that removes a target attacking or blocking Resonator from the game for two mana. Unless Basically, your J-Ruler is Zero, which is where it'll cost one to do that. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's like a sniper from a blind spot, but you Forever. banish it. <laughs> Which is a lot better than sniping from the blind spot, except sniping from the well, sniping from the blind spot's one blue. This is gonna be one white for zero, and this thing gets rid of it forever. But sniping has more chance to activate, you know that type of thing. Yeah, but so zero's magic light is a really good card, and sniping was used in basically the same style as zero's magic light's gonna be used. Yeah, basically just really really good tempo swings. Uh, in the late game, whenever your opponent's trying to swing for a game, you just remove things from the game. Yep, just say, nope, get rid of that, get rid of that, and get rid of that. So the last little comparison we have is to a card that uh, was really big back in uh, the Grim Cluster era, but because of keyword differences, lost a lot of play, which is Ebony Prophet, also known as Abdul Alhazred. Yep, he was the big control ruler of that time period, where um, it was like a toss-up between two rulers, which was Grim and Abdul. Uh, the biggest difference between the Abdul and Zero, of course Abdul has a little really like defensive play style. Abdul also had an OTK which made him really good. And then obviously he has his uh, preventing enter effects from going off, that's a continuous stun effect in a similar light to what Zero has. A continuous way to stop keyword abilities. Exactly. So if Ebony Prophet's all play, we can definitely expect Zero to see some solid play here. Yep. And that's pretty much all we have to say about that. So, uh, first we have some honorable mentions. Uh, these are cards that we see having a lot of potential, but not enough to put them onto our list. Uh, Cloning Magic, we really thought was a cool card, but we don't see where it's really broken yet. I think in future sets we might see a card that could break it, but for now, it's just not good enough. Yep. Uh, on another hand, Flame Dragon Veltia may spark some new deck designs. Obviously, uh, if you have a lot of cheap spells, say Regalia, you can toss them all on the field and then play the Flame Dragon. That's definitely an option. Uh, another uh, thing that I didn't realize was that... Flame King Shout. Flame King Shout can cheat him in. Yeah, I was going to tell you. I thought you knew. <laughs> for, yep, for three mana, you get a flying 12-12 with swiftness, and you deal 400 to everything on the board. So AoE, 12 to the face, and your opponent's sitting there crying. But obviously, this is a big combo card, so you have to hold off on everything before you can make that happen. Or dump your hand. Or dump your hand. That's always a good option. <laughs> and the last card on our list is Creature from Chaos, uh, one black Shadow Assassin, which except was a card from an old set. Yep, except the fact that Creature from Chaos is the first card with uh, the Death Touch ability, if you've played Magic the Gathering, where it destroys things that it deals damage to. It's the first one that does it to J Resonators, though. Yep, so that could mean a lot with it. Your opponent is thinking about J activating and this thing's on board they're gonna be like mm, I could really easily lose my J ruler here yep so and also a uh, little known fact it's got the eye of Sauron <laughs> 
so obviously this card is going to be great. All three of these cards have their potential and could see a lot of play, so we'll see what the future holds in store. But for now, let's go on to our top pick. Oh, baby. <laughs> Heavenly Gust. Man, some people saw this card and were like, eh, what could possibly go wrong? And I saw this card and I was like, well, there goes half the cards people like to play. Yep, so this is a two-mana quick cast card where you can choose one. Either you destroy target addition or regalia, that's bad. Or if you played something earlier in the turn, destroy all additions and regalia your opponent controls. That's well, insane. Uh, important to note, quick. we haven't had a card that's quick cast able to destroy additions or regalia. So technically when they go to call a stone, you could chase this card and ruin their stone lineup. Yep. Or you torrent it and then destroy everything that they have and make them sad because you go like heavy storm them or feather duster or however you want to call this card. Yep. <laughs> so again, we've been talking about ramp decks earlier. Uh, ramp decks will see this a lot because they have a lot of cheap spells they can play and then play this card so you get quick cast torrent. Mm -hmm. destroy everything but it'll also be a really good side card it'll make green one of the best sided colors in the game uh, it also card... makes people almost afraid to run rules mori along with exactly. hook in the game so between those two cards we might see people be like rules mori is not a good card yep we could also see people no longer trying to play that 28 regalia style deck that we've seen in the past uh well most really... people stop trying to play that because of moonbeam but oh. this is even more incentive yep it's but, like, don't try and put all your galley out on the board, it's all going to get blown up. Speaking of Moonbeam, we think this is going to have a similar oppressive effect on the metagame, where people are just like, we can't play the game because of Moonbeam. Yep. Moonbeam obviously was a huge, huge card for the game. Uh, made a lot of cards unable to be played, especially before the Astro Ruler rulings got left out. Yeah, so basically you were like, well, I'm going to have to play Reflect, because Reflect is the only one that's like reasonably okay if he died because he'd get so much value so quickly. Yep. Uh, the card to obviously to compare this to is Destructive Assault, which is uh, a spell chant, destroy target addition or regalia. Again, this thing has quick cast, so yeah. <laughs> it already becomes ten times better of a card. Yep. The only other way to get quick cast destroy regalia is to play Valentina 1.0 and then drop in Hera. Yeah, which is alright. Yeah. Not crazy, but it's alright. So obviously Heavenly Gust just has all of that wrapped into a bigger uh, package that can eventually just, you know, turn the entire tide of battle if your opponent has a lot of cards out on the board. Yep, it also to note, destroys additions so you can get rid of the Winsicle Refuges, which would be preventing your Black Moon Beams, and yep. also gets rid of Alexandria, which was a scary card in general, but... This is the reason we had to put Alexandria a little bit lower on our tier list. Yeah, because we were just like, this card is going to be too good. There's no way we could have an addition be the best card. Exactly. So that pretty much wraps up our thoughts on Heavenly Gust and on the entire set. Uh, thank you all for watching. I, we really think the set came out great. And if people have been like out of the game, you should definitely try and get them back into it. Cause this is absolutely one of the best ways to bring people back into this game. The set is very well put together, a lot of really cool ideas, lots of design space to work with, a lot of play styles you can work with, and all the cards feel playable, yep. yep. Just, uh, I'm so happy with the set. I am too. Honestly, uh, this is the first time in a while where I've really been hyped up for this for a Force of Will set. Uh, Battle for Adaractia was pretty weak, so was Vingolf. Seeing this come out and just all these new design spaces to work with, we're going to see some really solid gameplay. All right, so that's been uh, Joe and Mike from Deep Wood Force of Will signing out.